most important has happened, Chris, is the market lost momentum after the Fed uh, tapered in late 2014. The market's basically gone sideways since then. And up into May of 2015, the market was just barely making new highs instead of making stronger new highs as it had done for years in this rally with all the stimulus behind it. Now, since May, every time the market goes down, like those 2,000 points you're talking about, you know, it'll go down 10% or 15% or whatever, but it'll bounce back fiercer than ever. But every rally since then has not been able to make a new high for the first time. So to me, uh, this bubble is over. And the market's trying to make a new high here. I think it'll fail. I think we've seen the best of this rally. We may see a little higher, but I think not much more. And I think the most, the next downturn in the markets will be more serious than the ones we saw late last year and early this year. And, and by the summer, people are going to realize this bubble is over and then we're not going into a correction in a bull market, but we're going into a bear market that's going to last several years, but we're going to see the worst of it by late 2017. So I think, I think we are starting a serious crash. And just like in 2007 and eight, it took many months of the market only going down 10 or 15 percent and then rallying and trying to make new highs. And then it all fell apart in, in just a, a few months between uh, June and November of 2008. So I think this is the last chance for investors. You know, we, we warned in a lot of other investments, commodities and gold way back, and people thought that wasn't a real top. Well, everybody knows commodities have long topped, and gold is, is in a bear market, uh, even though it's rallying now in a, in a deserved rally. This time, where we are delevering, leveraging the biggest debt in financial asset bubble in modern history, um, and it's just starting. And, and people still don't get that, you know, this, this is a bubble that's got to burst, and this is not a correction. This is not a correction. I cannot say that more times. Firstly, on U.S. shares, a bubble, what it's really doing is reeling in the retail investors for a shellacking. Firstly, and then we'll get to a couple of the other important ones, i.e. leverage as well as precious metals. You know, I'm seeing signs of your U.S. shares comments, that whole ontology. We see that unfolding when you look individual. Each week, you know, many of us put out candidates for our subscribers, and I comb through a list of, you know, just the top companies with the best fundamentals. But even many of those have not recovered the way that the indices have recovered. That, to me, is a bearish contrarian indication that says, wait a minute, are the powers that be pumping up these indexes, or is it just the easiest way for the big money you know, to participate in the rally and boost their quarterly, end-of-quarter profits, make investors and hedge fund managers look a little better? That's the first thing. So, you know, I'm on board with you. I think this could be the top, especially when you look at price-to-earnings ratios, as we've seen across the board in the CAPE ratios. Many of these are unsustainable at any profit level. I'd like to move Move on, though, to the next topic, and that's levered. I'd like your thoughts on just what the implications of this could be, because this is a genie that's been let out of the bottle that I only think maybe one in ten financial analysts and economists really has their mind wrapped around the idea of leverage. And you, know, you can go into the FX market, and you can get 40 to 1, 100 to 1 leverage on just $1 or $100. Give us an idea of what this means means for the U.S. and global economies? Well, you know, Chris, I mean, there's still $550 trillion, that's not a typo, trillion dollars in credit default swaps and derivatives around the world, a lot of them held and backed by major banks. Deutsche Bank is the worst, and people would think German banks are sound. J.P. Morgan is the second worst, and then many, many more. There's two, we, we've gone... Debt in the world has gone from like 180 trillion total around the world to 250 now. So after the last correction, instead of deleveraging debt and kicking back and getting more sound, all this stimulus, all this low interest rate, zero interest rate policy has just encouraged more borrowing now, especially in emerging countries who are in the most trouble and going down the fastest because of the crash in commodity prices, which was caused by China's slowdown. We have more leverage than ever. And, and, and again, with zero interest rates, 
like you said, I mean, hedge funds, investors in all so many ways can now leverage up so cheaply that we basically just have a casino economy. Like, banks aren't taking money and lending it out, and, and consumers aren't borrowing money that much or businesses because they all over borrowed in the in the boom and in the bubble into 2007. So, so this theory that oh, if the Fed pumps money in the economy, it'll get lent and spent is just not happening. It's just going into speculation, and speculation causes bigger bubbles, which we have bigger bubbles in a lot of the state, bigger bubbles and definitely bigger bubbles in real estate around the world, and massive stock bubbles everywhere that are just going to have to burst. There's no way for this to end. Bubbles don't correct. They burst. They build up exponentially until they can't go any farther, and they don't come down slowly. They crash. People just don't get this, and, every, and all I do is go on media, and, and everybody I debate says, well, Harry, this isn't a bubble because it's not as bad as the tech bubble, but price-earning ratios aren't 44. They've never been 44 in history except for one time in the most perfect economy in the 90s with, with falling inflation, strong technology growth and productivity, the strongest years of spending for the baby boom, and, and a positive geopolitical cycle where nothing, absolutely nothing went wrong in the world after the fall of Ber Berlin Wall. This is not that era. So price earnings ratios now cyclically adjusted by Schiller, the best way to do it, average earnings, not peak earnings, are, are at 27 as high as they've been in, in any time and in, in six other bubble and in, in major uh, bull market peaks except the early 2000 bubble was higher and the 1929 bubble was higher. The market is very overvalued, especially when you take into account the fact that the world simply is. I mean, where is there not civil wars? You know, where is there not problems in the world? Where is there not terrorism, as this morning again? And the mar stock market's, you know, down a teeny bit after another major terrorist attack in Europe. What is wrong with this market? It is a market on crack. It is delusional, and it's being fed by free money and speculation, and it is going to go down so hard when it goes down, people aren't going to believe it. That's the only way this can be resolved. There's no other way out of this. 70% in the next two years, Chris. S&P and Dow, the major U.S. stock market. You do realize the implications of a move like that. Yeah, yeah. You think people are pissed off now and voting for Trump and Sanders. Wait until that happens. But what about the Federal Reserve and all of our wonderful policymakers? Surely they have a bag of tricks in store for this. Yeah, they've had a bag of tricks for six years, seven years now. Looks where, it, where it's gotten us. A bigger bubble is going to burst. This is going to be the biggest single failure of monetary policy since John Law in 1720 in the Mississippi and South Seas bubbles, the greatest stock crashes of their time in Europe because central governments had high debts and basically sold off phony assets like the Mississippi Swampland and the South Sea Trading Company to the public financed by low interest rates by a Federal Reserve like bank back then a central bank. This is what central banks do. They try to make everything fine. They keep pumping up the economy. They keep lowering interest rates. They keep inducing speculation until the bubble blows. And this is not going to go down well for central banks. We may not have any central banks after this. They will lose so much credibility. No, it's a powerful statement. And if I could parallel your thoughts for a moment, you know, there really are some interesting similarities. If you do look at the Mississippi scheme, they sent hundreds and hundreds of people in these uh, rickety boats to Louisiana, promising them the promised land. And it was marsh and swampland, as we all know. We have the bayou. What what we currently have, I think you might agree, is really backed by nothing. At least you had the Mississippi property. No one could give it away fast enough. The king of France eventually sold it to the United States for pennies on the dollar simply because they didn't want it on their books anymore. I think that the U.S. could be facing something even worse, but you know they're going to go down fighting. So give us an idea of how that plays out. The one government that is the most restricted right now is the U.S. Fed because we tapered stopped, you know, printing free money, and Japan kept doing it more and then stepped it up three times. Europe's doing it again strongly. It's easier for them to keep upping the ante, but it's going to be a major decision for the Fed after tapering number one and then number two, raising short-term rates just that quarter of a point, 
to turn around and say, oops, we were wrong, we're not in a sustainable recovery, and we have to start lowering rates again, go to negative interest rates, and have to start QE again. That is going to be a huge um, turnaround. And so they're not going to do that too abruptly. And I think by time the U.S. Fed reacts, I think by the summer, and especially by the end of this year, it's going to be obvious we're in a recession. It's going to be obvious that Italy is failing, Greece is failing again, Southern Europe, Europe. And, and, and then, yes, at some point, not only is all central banks going to try to up the ante, but, but look, they've already done it. Japan has stimulated QE since early 2013 now for three years, three times the rate we did at our peak, or Europe and the other thing, and they're back in recession. And their stock market's going down after going up. This stuff doesn't work at a point. These central banks are going to keep fighting. They have no other choice. As soon as they stop these stimulus policies, we'll go down even faster. And they know that. But they are going to go down anyway. They're trying to keep a bubble. Their solution to the bubble bursting is to just keep pumping up the bubble because you can't pump up lending when everybody's too much in debt. And you can't grow when businesses have already overexpanded jobs and capacity. There's no way to get out of this except for keep pumping up the bubble and, and just hoping it doesn't burst while you're still in office as a Federal Reserve chairman or as a president or a premier of a country. That's all everybody's just doing is trying to push this thing to the next administration in every country because nobody wants the Great Depression on their watch, and it is coming. There is no way to avoid this. I can understand now uh, why you might be uh, a little bit pessimistic on the commodity sector under such a scenario, but relative to paper assets, even though the actual dollar price of the metals could decline during a crash, if that comes to pass, the only refuge that might have any value at all relative to paper assets, which could still be declining, but relative would be precious metals. Maybe down the road, but not here. I mean, here's, here's the good news about commodities. They've already been demolished. Commodities are already in a depression. Iron, ore, and copper, and all the key industrial commodities are down 70 80% already. So they don't have as much downside. Now, certainly they're not going to like the world falling into a deeper downturn. But they've already been demolished, and, and precious metals have been hit pretty darn bad. The safe haven, Chris, and I've had to say this over and over again, and nobody gets it. The only asset in the last crash and since that has gone up in value has been the U.S. dollar versus other currencies and the highest quality sovereign bonds in the best countries, you know, you know U.S., Germany, whatever. That, that's been it. I mean, when you have a bubble burst, all financial assets have been inflated by too much debt and too much speculation, all of them, even most bonds and certainly junk bonds. So everything goes down. And, and I'm not a fan of the U.S. dollar forever. I'm just saying in the early stages of this crisis, to debate people like Peter Schiff all the time who say, the dollar is falling, the dollar is crashing. Peter, the dollar has been nothing but up since the beginning of this crisis in early 2008. It, it was up the most when, when the crisis was at its worst in the second half of 2008. And, and even in the recovery with unprecedented money printing, the dollar has been more up than down, and it's up 40% off of its lows in early 2008. The dollar has been the safe haven, and gold and silver have held up better than most commodities, but they're still down. Gold's still down, I don't know, 40% off its highs or something like that recently. And we've been call I've been calling for months that gold was due for a major counter rally, that it had gotten oversold and, and overly pessimistic, and it's rallying here, but I'm telling you, I think the gold doesn't, gold doesn't make it much past 1400 before it turns down. And I think my forecast is gold is going to be at 700 bucks by mid to late 2017. And that might be a long-term bottom. Because, again, I think gold is going to hold up better than other commodities. Let me throw one proviso in here before we continue with this and get too negative. If you ever take a look at the gold to ruble ratio or ruble to gold ratio, the same thing was occurring in Russia until the oil crisis. And then you saw gold make an about face and blast higher by 100% in just over two and a half months' time. So there are times when, you know, King Canute 
can't command the tides, and we can't always uh, know the future when it comes to markets. That's why I think you'd agree a good solid 10, 15, or 20 percent precious metals portfolio ratio is always a good idea. Gold is the single best inflation hedge, and and you look at history, our history has been mostly inflationary. Deflationary periods like the 30s are rare, and I think we're entering another one. So I, I would only be more skittish in a time like that. You know, but, but if gold went down, and when I'm using the 700, I use 7 to 750, but that is where gold corrected in 2008. And it went down 33% before it bubbled up with all the money printing at first. So that is the natural. At that level, I would consider adding gold to my portfolio because that could be a bottom, although I think down the road it could go lower. But that, that's when gold at least erases most of its bubble. And it was a bubble, by the way. Gold bubbled like everything else. It went up eight times in 10 years. That's a bubble. You say gold loves an inflationary environment. Yes, we had seen some signs of deflation. However, you do have to recognize, I'm sure you'd have to agree on a weekly basis, the greenback has broken. 100% of its support levels might be entering a downtrend. in the com That's number one. Number two, we've got the U.S. Fed. The rumors, hints, innuendo that we may actually see negative interest rates, and it looks like there will be at most one or two more quarter point uh, rate hikes. Chris, you do not have to worry about rate hikes. Mark my words on this. And if it happens, there might be one more. The economy is going to be so bad by the end of this year, there's not, not going to ever be talk of a rate hike ever again. The only move they have in the coach's playbook, first page in the book is inflate, inflate, inflate under that scenario. Japan. Japan has, again, done QE at three times the rate that we ever did continued and gone to negative interest rates in recent months. And guess what? It's stock markets down. Guess what? It's economies in recession. It's their death. I would just like to accentuate your points here and say maybe there's some tangents we haven't quite investigated fully yet. So, for instance, I'm with you, BOJ. But let's not also forget we have several European individual countries, not to mention the EU, all now issuing uh, negative interest rates. You know, the biggest trend right now in Europe, as well as Japan, is buying fortified home safes and banks because people don't want to put their money in the bank because you lose money under those scenarios. If we see something similar in the United States, gold, which hasn't corrected in the terms of many other currencies, actually remains in an uptrend, might be the best safe haven because you can't lose interest on gold. I'm 100% on this. and Gold correlates incredibly well with inflation, and we're seeing nothing but lower inflation and deflation ultimately. Second, if you go all the way back to 1700s and adjust gold for inflation or real estate by the, for that matter, gold does not appreciate. It is an inflation hedge and commodities tend to be inflation heads and we're heading into a deflation area. If I thought we were heading into an inflationary area, yes, I'd buy gold. If I was in the Russian ruble, yes, I'd buy gold because, yeah, the ruble collapses. Of course, gold's going to go up in rubles. The U.S. dollar is not collapsing. You've been in a 103 to, to one, uh, 93 to 100 range now for months. And if it breaks off the top of that, it's going to go up to 120 at least. When the dollar goes to 120, then I would consider buying gold because I think the dollar would have pretty much run its course, and then I'll, I'll no longer be bullish on the U.S. dollar. But I am bullish on the U.S. dollar, especially in the early stages of this crisis. And the U.S. dollar keeps going up, gold's going to keep going down. You know, that's what makes a market, right? I mean, we have to have bulls, we have to have bears. I mean, I, I can't see how you would prefer to add U.S. shares to your portfolio over a beaten down asset class like the precious metals. Any day of the week right now, I take commodities over stock, but I just don't like any of them. But on a purely valuation basis, gold is superior to shares. Can we agree on that? Absolutely. I, I, again, got to buy something, a, a, a risk asset. I would buy gold over U.S. stocks any day of the week. Harry S. Dent, Jr., tell folks more about H.S. Dent Forecast Newsletter, your ETF, as well as Survive and Prosper. Simplest thing, you go to harrydent.com. We, we will send you our latest book for free. You just pay four ninety five for shipping. And we have a free daily newsletter. It's actually been changed to economy and markets. And we can put, all you do is put your email address in. You're on our free newsletter. We have other newsletters, but to get to know us, 
it's a great newsletter with high content and no risk, no no money, nothing. Just put your email in, you're done. HarryDent.com.